Hey everyone, in today's video we're going to finish up this MCS 3233. Now in the first video you saw that we had a failed power supply and a failed transformer. I didn't see the failed power supply until I found the failed transformer actually, so if you missed out on that, go check it out. It's a really good exercise in troubleshooting. Once we got that all fixed up, we saw that the controls were really dirty, some of the lights weren't working, and uh, the tuner meters aren't quite working either. So we're going to address all those things in this video, and we're going to start with the cleaning. And if the camera was just shaking, that's because our friend Sadie wanted to stop by and make sure she's known. Maybe she'll come back later, we'll see. So this receiver is actually kind of nice because it's not hard to get to the controls at all. You can actually access just about all of this right through here without taking off the faceplate. So that's maybe the first thing I like about this receiver. Now this was like crazy dirty. So what we're going to do to clean these controls is we're not going to start with deoxid. We're actually going to start with just general contact cleaner and then we'll finish with deoxid because we want to flush out as much dirt as we can before we uh, do anything else. Maybe you can see that, but there's actually a little gear that pushes something forward and back. And then right next to it is your classic switch that just has all the contacts on it. So let's start right here with this one. Basically we're just going to go nuts. Just get it real nice and clean. That's good. Now let's go here. Yeah, there's like a little hole right here. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to start spraying right in there. And maybe underneath here too. Not sure completely how this switch works. Now that that one is probably dried a little bit, let's go hit it with some D5. And the D5 is probably all we're going to need on this one. So I will start looks like the actual contacts, the faces, are on the other side of this. So I want to get my straw in on this side the best I can. And just not too much. Just enough to get some in there. And that'll probably be good for that switch there. Now, the one next to it, that might be plastic, so we're just going to hit it with the uh, F5, because that's a little bit nicer on uh, carbon comp pots, whereas that one right here, that's all metal on metal. And that's what D5 is good for, metal on metal. I'll tell you what, this selector switch already feels much better. Now, let's move on to these three switches right here in the middle. These three switches are probably best gotten through the uh, front. So, I will take the faceplate off to clean this eventually. So, once we take the faceplate off, we just kind of go in through the opening and uh, get them that way. But for now, let's work on these uh, potentiometers over here. You see we've got two of them buried in that mess. One is for balance, one is for volume. The volume is on this side, and this one's the balance. The volume pot we can get into pretty well. Start with the contact cleaner and just, uh, you know, flush out all the junk. I'll let the contact cleaner evaporate a little bit, and then I'll hit it with the uh, F5, and that'll be okay for us. And then beyond the volume knob over here are the three uh, tone control pots, the base, mid, treble. There's an opening for all of those on the bottom of each one of these pots, so I think. Again, once I take the faceplate off, maybe I'll be able to remove this board, and then I'll be able to get better access to the uh, bottom openings on these potentiometers. And that would just be a good old contact cleaner first, and then the F5, because they are carbon pots. And the last thing we have on here to clean is this uh, speaker selector switch. This is the five button thing you saw earlier. I think what we'll want to do here is again get the receiver maybe upside down and then we'll be able to get those switches from the top. And that's going to be really hard to show on camera so I'm just going to do it off camera. But that's basically in a nutshell what I'm doing to clean the controls on this receiver. Alright so I was just taking off the controls and stuff. I wasn't recording. I didn't think it'd be interesting. 
but uh, you see I've got this here and a napkin and a flathead um, you might know where this is going so this is not coming off and uh, you know how these come off you know it's just like a little spline shaft like this you know whatever put it on t comes off whatever this is the same thing right well look what has happened this thing was very stubborn it would not come off and let's zoom in here show you what's going on we've removed the entire shaft going inside of here that's held on by these set screws this is what started coming out as I got it loose and I haven't taken it out all the way yet but uh, yeah that's that's not supposed to happen and now this is just loose in here which is really really quite inconvenient um, because I need that to stay there and not ruin the the string winding okay we'll just stick that piece of wire in there for now maybe that'll hold it in place long enough continuing to clean the controls I'm working on these toggle switches here I just want to zoom in on a way I found is working pretty okay if you see you kinda of see an opening there but then when I close it it closes and there's an opening right there so what I'm doing is I'm taking the uh, just general contact cleaner because these are really dirty I go to the open part stick right in there good squirt open the other side good squirt and we're gonna exercise the heck out of that I've already done that for the other six and then what we'll do is we'll take some F5 I'm just gonna assume that these are super cheap inside and they might use carbon um, I really don't know if you should use F5 or D5 here but you know I have this in my hand so let's use it um, I think I've let, I think I've given this enough time to evaporate since I initially sprayed it. So we'll just do a little tiny squirt squirt and just do the same thing. And while we're cleaning, we've got new lights here from dgwojo.com. He even sent one spare for me. He always does that. I appreciate that. So, um, let's figure out how you do this because I, I honestly don't know. one. I only half destroyed this thing, so now I know to do better on the next one. For these lights, basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to continue to remove these wires here. And I'm going to reuse them because they're a nice thin wire for this application and I don't really have anything in stock that's uh, quite that thin. So we'll strip all of these. Those were actually pretty hard to strip honestly. So the old light bulbs, I think they came from the factory with those wires just kind of in there. So these new ones here we're going to have to bend down these leads and we'll need to just kind of slip this wire through a little bit it is a little tough to manipulate uh, this wire here especially when you've got it on these fragile um, leads for these lamps and we'll take our iron and just kind of get a small amount of solder on there see if we can get it to take then we'll just take this and slide it through. See if we have any exposed conductor at the end of this. And address it if necessary, but it might be okay. So we have a little bit of exposed conductor here, but honestly, I'm really not that worried about it. Um, this isn't a place you're going to be putting your finger really and even if you do it's it's only 8 volts it's not really uh, that dangerous like I said at this point this just goes uh, back on here does it even stay no it doesn't stay okay so we'll have to glue them on like they were from the factory <laughs> So I've 
Got all the leads soldered on, and now we need to uh, glue these because they don't actually have any way of securing themselves. So I guess I'll do that real quick. I'm not sure what the right type of glue to use here is, but we'll just start right here. Yes. Okay, I guess I'll let that dry. Now I'm going to clean the controls. Well, there was just one huge problem in my attempt to be resourceful. I did not double check to see if the wire would actually reach the circuit board. So, uh, yeah, I guess I need to create some extensions for four wires. Or very teeny tiny itty bitty wires, which is going to be just a blast. I guess I can start by getting these two back where they used to be, and then I'll work on the mistake. Okay, I've got my four ends installed. I stripped each one after I installed it, and I've got little pieces of heat shrink tubing over each wire. So now let's just kind of do what we can to bring these around. Okay, I got those kind of twisted around, so it looks like that worked. So now I can slide this over. Alright, now let's do the same thing over here. Okay, now let's light them on fire. Not bad, not bad. Looks like we have a visitor. We have a visitor. Say hello. Say hello. Probably shouldn't get you so close to the turned on soldering iron. Okay. Well, it appears we, I don't know, an hour plus later, in multiple days, finally have a light job completed on this thing, which is really obnoxious. Um, I think I'll just throw this on the dim bulb real quick and see if uh, the lights work. Oh, where's the power switch on this thing? Let's see. Hey, would you look at that. All the lights work. That is a great thing to see. Okay. Cool. Now we know we can put this back in and, uh, not worry about it too much. Okay, now that this is back together, uh, how about we take a quick listen? Um, the only thing I anticipate, and I haven't shown this, is uh, the signal strength meter does not work. I think that's about the only thing left to troubleshoot with this receiver. And we also get to see how it looks with uh, lamps. So let's, uh, let's try this out. Oh. Interesting. I think... Uh, Yeah, sometimes receivers are weird like that. Um, when you turn them on on the dim bulb and you have speakers connected, sometimes it'll just light a bright bulb even though nothing is wrong. So I'll show you that again. I've got it on A speakers. And you can see it's just, uh, it's trying to, uh, yeah, I think it's just trying to pull enough current to uh, get itself going. So that uh, bulb slowed it down. It was taking up all the uh, stuff for a moment there. So no need to worry. Not a big deal there. It happens. Um, let's switch to FM. Got FM stereo light. You know, one thing we don't have is uh, selector lights or power lights. So that's kind of interesting. Maybe, hopefully that's something simple. Uh, so far, everything sounds uh, pretty good. 
give, let's give it the real test. How about that? Here's everyone's favorite song. We're sounding much better. The balance knob is clean. The selectors are clean. Very interesting. I don't really understand the uh, tone defeat. That's real weird. That makes no sense to me, folks. That is really bizarre. And I'm beginning to lose my patience with this thing. I think I can close this up by doing a quick power test because, you know, that's always fun. We'll see what the waveforms look like. So what we are looking for is 33 watts per channel. Like we've got our scope hooked up. And when we come up, we hit clipping at around 17 volts. Let's call it that 16.1 because there's some little detents in the volume knob. And if I go to the one, it clips. If I go back to the other, it does not. So let's just call it 16.1. And what does that calculate to? That actually calculates to 32.4 watts per channel. So that's actually pretty funny. Um, it is performing exactly as it should be. Uh, let's examine the other channel and see what it's up to. And yeah, we'll do a little switcheroonie. Alright, let's see it. There's your clipping. Yep, about the same deal. Uh, you don't quite get the same voltage at that uh, stop on the volume knob, but you know they're behaving very similarly. 16.5 um, maybe is where clipping starts. So, if you plug that in, that's about 34 watts per channel. So. Yeah, not bad. It's performing. It is performing just fine. Yeah, look how hard you can get it to clip. Don't want to do that too much though. Let's see. Now that's interesting. Remember I said this switch was doing something weird? Yeah, look what happens when you... When you do that. It gets quieter and the waveform is awful. I don't understand that, and both channels do it. So that's, that's, oh god. That's really bad. Um, and then when you turn tone D feet on, what the hell? This is the receiver that keeps on giving. I'm beginning to struggle with how I'm going to make this uh, coherent video. Uh, so you just saw it was working when you had tone defeat turned off, or on I guess. I checked the switch. The switch works just fine. So that means there's something to, in the circuitry wrong. And I have a vague idea, but I'm not exactly sure. And then I was trying to figure out the signal strength meter on the tuner and uh, I don't really know what that is but I was messing around with the power supply I was like checking to see what the voltages were around these uh, output pins I guess and then I don't know if this is what happened but this is how I remember it I was being careful I just touched one of these while I had my other pin right there because I was just you know testing DC voltage to ground and I saw a spark, the tuner was on, and it just stopped. And then I just pulled the Zener diode out of there on the power supply. And I hit this button here. And it says the Zener diode is short-circuited. So, I uh, now I have to fix the power supply. 
I have a 13 volt zener, that's a 12 volt, so I guess I'll throw that in and see if that works. Um, as long as zener diodes, if you get it like within a volt or something, you should be okay. It's the uh, the power level that you gotta be careful about. Uh, that's a WZ120, which generally means half watt, 12 volt zener diode. I have a half watt, 13 volt around, so I'll try that. Okay, so at this point, I need four new LEDs. I need to fix the power supply. I need to figure out why the tuning meter is not working, or a signal strength meter. And the, the FM tuning meter was kind of, I don't know, stiff seeming. Oh yeah, and then figure out why uh, the tone controls aren't working. Replacing that Zener diode brought the uh, tuner back to life, which is great. Now I'm gonna just take the same voltage measurements I'm pretty sure I did before. I must have shorted against something and not known it. Uh, but yeah, we've got a working tuner again. So that makes me happy. So some good news to report. I have figured out why the indicator lamps won't work and I figured out why the signal strength meter won't work. Let's start with the indicator lamps. Uh, this right here is the LED for the power light. And oddly enough, if we throw it on this little tester here, we see that it's uh, shorted. So fun fact about this circuit, all of these indicators and the power lamp all use the same power feed from the power supply. So this one is always on, so it was constantly shorting everything to ground, so there was no power for these lamps to use. So that's great. Uh, I pulled it, and then it turns out only two of the five lamps work. I will show you. When I switch the uh, selector switch here, we see the radio ones don't work. The only ones that work are aux and phono. Now here's the more interesting one. I was uh, looking around the power supply, trying to figure out, okay, why does the signal strength meter not work? Here it is working. Here's what I did. First, I went into the schematic and looked to see, you know, what powers this. I found a variable resistor, VR3, on the tuner board. I turned it, and suddenly this thing shot all the way to the top. And I turned it back down, and it stayed there. So I was like, huh, that's kind of weird. And then I started kind of tapping it like this. And when I turned it down, I saw it like, kind of coming down as I tapped it. So that told me right there, this thing is stuck. So then I opened it like this. And I'd go like that, and it would just stay in place. So what I did is I sprayed it with contact cleaner. That did nothing. But then if you zoom in really close, at the top right there, there's a little screw. And all I did was loosen that just a hair. And now we have a working signal strength meter. So that's that. And then I set it on a strong station to go to like four and a half. So... Um, yeah, that's that's how that worked. So I'll just tape this back up here and uh, put it away. All right, that's back to normal. And I'll just show that in action one more time here. Look at that. Working tuner meters. It's a wonderful thing, folks. And then probably the strangest thing that I looked at, I was going through the service manual, and uh, whoever uploaded the service manual included the addendums to this thing which included things such as these board diagrams are illegible, here's more legible ones. I kid you not, I'll put a screenshot of that up. And two, there's a resistor right here. Apparently it was supposed to be an 800 ohm quarter watt resistor. What I found was a 3.3K. This is what I pulled out, it doesn't want to focus on it. And then what I had in my parts bin was a 825 ohm 3 watt. So. That's there now, and it seems to be working just the same as it did before. So, I guess at this point, the only issue is this weird behavior out of the preamp with the uh, tone to feet on and off. Alright, I got it. It was capacitors, so let's go on a little trip here. Let's take a look at this here schematic, because that's what's going to explain everything to us. So this here is the preamplifier and your signal comes in around here. You can see we've got the loudness switch, we've got the tone defeat switch most notably, we've got our bass, mid, and treble potentiometers in here, and let's just take a look at this tone defeat switch. So basically what this switch does is it 
basically switches on and off between this section of the preamplifier, it defeats the tone controls. Basically, it bypasses them. So let's follow this channel right here. You know, we're coming in, we're going to this transistor, then this transistor, then we're going through right here. But then take a look at this. Right here, we go into the tone defeat switch. Same thing up here, right here. We go into the tone defeat switch. And where's that switch going to take us? It's going to take us all the way to basically the end of the preamplifier. It's going to completely bypass all of this. So why is that important? Well, if you recall, the behavior we were seeing was these guys didn't do anything. In my testing, these guys, when I removed them, nothing happened. So I thought that was kind of interesting. I was like, oh god, there's some issue inside of here. So in my testing, what I eventually did was I basically looked at the output of this right here, which is basically going to be coming off of your collector on each transistor. So between the end of this stage and the switch is this capacitor right here. These two guys right here. So what I did was I got out the scope and I put a sine wave through. So you saw on the schematic at the collector of that last transistor, that third transistor in the preamplifier, you should see a signal. So that's going to be right here. And when I do that, we see a signal. I can control that with the volume knob. And most, most notably, this is one kilohertz. If I turn up the mid-range knob, it gets louder. See how that's happening right there? So that right there told me that the preamplifier stage is working. These knobs work. I then changed it to 10 kilohertz and then 20 hertz to, me to measure with the bass and treble knobs because, you know, those are the frequency ranges where something will happen. Like the bass does nothing here, treble does very little here because of, you know, this is 1 kilohertz. That is a mid-range frequency. Here's that signal again. What does it look like on the other side of that capacitor? I'll tell you what, it did not look like that. There was absolutely nothing there. So I pulled that capacitor, and here they are right here. Take a look at those. So, the one looked okay, but when I tested it, it was just a completely open circuit. And then this one right here, I haven't broken it off yet, but look how loose that leg is, and now it's, it's just going to fall off. So, what I find very interesting is that this happened in the same place on each channel. Like, these capacitors are everywhere else in this amplifier. Why was it these that failed so spectacularly? So I looked at the voltage rating. It's, you know, 25 volt, 10 microfarad. You know, maybe they were just taking a bit of a hit from uh, the signal. Maybe they needed to be a larger value. So what I did was I installed 50 volt, 10 microfarad caps in their place. I don't know if that's going to do anything or matter at all, but that's just something I thought might be an okay idea. So of course, we got to do it, and here it is. And this time, these work. So that's good stuff. See, don't get that change in volume anymore. It just does what it's supposed to do. Let's see, you can defeat them or not. So that's it. This thing is fully functional now. Finally. Well, almost. I still need to fix the uh, burnt out LEDs in here. Um, what I did for that is I just threw it on my uh, Peak Atlas DCA55. It gave me the forward voltage of one of the good diodes, and then I went on Mauser and found a red, cloudy looking one, and I'll order that and see if it works, but that's basically all you have to do for that. I don't have time to wait for those to come in, I gotta get this video out, so uh, yeah, many of you wanted to see this, I wasn't going to publish this, but after the really positive response from the initial video from this, I knew I had to give you all what you want, so here you go. Uh, this one really tested my patience. I'm glad I got through it. I'm glad I figured it out. And uh, 
you know, we just keep getting better at this stuff. And that's what it's all about, you know? There's always a solution to problems with these things, and it just takes a little bit of patience and time to really dive in, learn how it works, and find the issue. And most of the time, it's really not that complicated. I mean, can you believe it was just these two little things that made such a huge problem? It's pretty interesting. So, all right, that's it. Thank you so much for watching. I got to make that STK50 video now, so stay tuned for that. I'll see you in the next one.